Hi, my name is Jeff Garish. I'm chairman of the board of Garish McCrary Smith Consultants and Garish McCrary Smith Attorneys, two firms based in Memphis, Tennessee that exclusively represent community banks nationwide. This is the introduction to a series of presentations produced by the Independent Community Bankers of America, the largest trade association for community banks in the United States. The presentations are five in number and will deal with issues of importance for directors and officers of community banks including general duties and responsibilities of directors and officers, duties and responsibilities in connection with mergers and acquisitions, in connection with the lending function, with respect to corporate governance, and in dealing with the regulators. I hope you enjoy this series of presentations, each of which will be accompanied by a CD containing copies of the PowerPoints as well as high quality handout material. Give you a little bit of my background, I started over 30 years ago with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation as a law clerk and a young lawyer, progressed with them, was the first head of the division that sued bank directors uh, for negligence when their banks failed, closed down a number of banks for them, sold them off, did a lot of enforcement work. Since that time I've had the opportunity to help uh, through our two firms, over 1,500 banks from Maine to Alaska in connection with their needs and strategic planning, mergers and acquisitions and all the issues you'll see in this series of uh, presentations. Just for the record, I'm not an academic, I'm a practitioner. Uh, the things that I'll discuss in this series of presentations are things that I've experienced and, and we have done uh, through our firms. Hope you enjoy the presentations. As a side note, I do have a couple books out that the ICBA uh, supplies and you can get from them. One, Garish's Glossary for Bank Directors, especially for new directors. And the other one is Garish's uh, Commandments for Community Bank Directors. That one's complete with my high school picture on the back. Hope you enjoy the presentations. Bank Directors, Duties and Responsibilities is the title of this presentation. If you uh, listen to the introduction, you'll know that uh, part of my checkered past is that I was the first head of the division at the FDIC that sued bank directors when their banks failed. Very early on in my career, in the, early, in the late 70s actually, I had embedded uh, in my psyche what our job is as directors because I was continuously looking at situations where directors had not done their job. Fast forward about 20 years, I also went on the board of directors of a bank myself. So I spent five years there and I understand the duties from that side of the table. So what I'm going to try and give you in this presentation is a discussion of practical issues associated with our duties and responsibilities uh, as directors. Overview of the presentation, I'll talk, give you a little bit about our duties and responsibilities. I'll focus on our real duty, which in my opinion is to enhance shareholder value, and then I'll give you some discussion of uh, duties in specific areas, seven or eight specific areas, uh, that should give you some practical insight as to what our job is uh, as bank directors and officers. I mentioned our primary duty is to enhance shareholder value. Actually, our primary duty is to allocate financial and managerial capital to enhance shareholder value. One of the questions I always get from the directors, because I've been promoting and suggesting or discussing that it's our duty to enhance shareholder value, for the last 25 years, how do we know if we're doing that? And that's a legitimate question because you can get somebody like me who's a consultant or a lawyer out in the industry in and out of three or four banks a week saying, oh, you need to, you need to uh, enhance shareholder value, but the real question is how do we know if we're doing that? So 20 years ago or so, I came up with what I call the four-part harmony as to how we know we're doing that. Uh, we have four tests here. We look at earnings per share growth, and I'd always said 8 to 10 percent a year. Return on equity, in my last 20 years it's been target 15 percent a year or above. Liquidity for the shares, meaning the ability of one of our shareholders to sell a share of stock at a fair price the time they want. And the last one involves cash flow coming off our stock. Do we have an appropriate dividend policy? Are we returning capital to our shareholders? I received an email a number of months ago from a client who basically said, Garish, I have a problem with my directors, and my response was, what's that? Answer, they're starting to listen to you. Uh, and what he's referring to is they're listening to these metrics I've put out about enhancing value. And the email comment was, don't you think in this environment you ought to change those metrics? In other words, we can't grow earnings 8 to 10% a year. We sure can't get a return on equity. Well, I told that uh, friend and client that uh, you know I'd look at that I initially told him I thought that these were still good targets. In view of what's happening in the industry, and we talk about our duty to enhance shareholder value, that hasn't changed. 
call it maintain if you want in this in industry environment we're in in August of 2009. But the reality is we still need to look at these four parts. I think one thing that will change as we move forward because we're re being required to maintain more equity in our banks is that return on equity target of 15% is going to have to come down a little bit. And I would suggest to you that probably a normalized return on equity here uh, would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 12. So use that as a target. Now the real question is, okay, Garish, we're supposed to enhance the value for our shareholders. Here's the four-part harmony against which we test it, but how does it work in the real world? Well, the real test as we begin to make strategic decisions going forward is, are our shareholders better off if we don't do this, or are they better off if we do it? For example, an acquisition transaction. CEO walks into the boardroom, and I'm an outside director, and the CEO says, we've been looking at acquiring this bank in the next town. We've gotten outside help. We have priced it. We've done due diligence. We think we ought to go ahead and buy it, and we think this is what we ought to pay for it. My question, if I'm an outside director to that CEO, will be, you tell me how this will serve to enhance the value for our shareholders. If the CEO's been doing his or her job, they'll say, well, Jeff, our earnings per share, if we don't do this deal, we project over the next five years, will average uh, growth about three or four percent. If we do this deal, we think it'll be six. Our return on equity, if we don't do the deal, will be somewhere in the six to eight range. If we do the deal, it'll be 10 to 12 because we're leveraging the company up. We're going to have some growth with it. It probably won't impact the liquidity on the stock, and it certainly won't reduce our dividends, so we're maintaining that. So this four-part harmony, we can use to tell whether we're doing our job in big picture, allocating appropriate resources, managerial and financial, to enhance the value for our shareholders. <clears throat> so what are our real, when we get down into the specifics, what are our legal duties? Let me put my lawyer hat on here for a minute. We have two main duties. We have a duty of care to act as reasonably prudent bank or bank holding company directors. Now you noted, those of you who may be looking at this uh, presentation, that our lawyers used to think, well, that's kind of the common man standard, the reasonably prudent person. It's not. It's the reasonably prudent bank or bank holding company director, which is a higher standard of care. If you go back to the 1850s and some of the legal cases the Supreme Court decided, et cetera, they said banks are fiduciaries to the public monies. And I'm not talking about municipal funds. I'm talking about human beings, our customers who walk in and make deposits. And as directors, we're fiduciaries of those banks. So we're held to a higher standard than just this common man or woman standard. We're held to the standard of the common bank director. We also have a duty of loyalty, and that's basically to avoid conflicts of interest, not to do anything uh, that would be inappropriate as it relates to the corporation, not to take a corporate opportunity. I'll give you a couple examples of uh, situations where I've seen boards um, violate the duty of loyalty, or I'll let you decide. One of these was a uh, board meeting where the board met on, let's say, February and said, we're going to branch into the next town, and we want to buy this piece of property on the corner of Fifth and Main. During that meeting, all the outside directors listened. They said, yeah, go ahead. After the meeting, one of the outside directors went to the next town, acquired the property at Fifth and Main for his own personal account, came back to the meeting in March and offered to sell it to the bank at about a $100,000 uptick, a clear breach of the duty of loyalty. How about this one for a breach of the duty of loyalty? You tell me. Bank has an operations center, has retail on the bottom, director's meeting, the CFO's in there saying we're trying to get some tenants for the retail. We've talked to one, two, three, four, and five about coming in there. One of the outside directors leaves the meeting. He has a strip center half a mile down the street. He knows these tenants are looking for space. He then goes to get them in his own strip center. Clear breach of the duty of loyalty, uh, taking of a corporate opportunity. Let me give you one other one that is not quite as clear cut. Say the board of directors as part of its long-term strategy establishes a strategy that redeeming our own shares, buying them back into treasury, is a good thing. So any shares that come on the market, we want to redeem. You're a director, you're walking down the street, and John Smith comes up to you, who's a high school buddy of yours, and says, John, you're still a director of that bank, aren't you? And he said, yes. And um, he says, I want to sell you my shares that I got from my mother. She said they should only go to your family. Well, now the corporation has a policy, only shares can be redeemed by the corporation. So what's the director do? Cut to the answer, if he were to acquire those shares without the knowledge of the rest of the board or the corporation, he'd be taking a corporate opportunity. Doesn't mean he can't buy the shares, just means it's a question of disclosure. Uh, it's a disclosure issue. He needs to go to the board of directors and discuss it with them. So we have these two main duties, the duty of care and the duty of loyalty. So think about those. We also have some sub-duties within there, like the duty of confidentiality. Okay, what, stay, what happens in the boardroom stays in the boardroom. 
Uh, I've dealt with a number of troubled banks, a large number of troubled banks over my career, kind of cyclically as the economy goes down. Usually the word on the street as to the bank, fact that a bank is troubled comes from inside the boardroom. You know, loose lips at the country club or on the golf course or something like that about the uh, difficulties a director is going through as a, as a director of a difficult bank. So we do have a duty of confidentiality as well.